Hello, and welcome back to this bittersweet dramatic reading, because that's right, it's the last, the last recording of, the last installment of, you might say, of The Last Unicorn by the great Peter S. Beagle. Thank you for being with me all the way here to the end. We had a very dramatic session last time, over an hour, that session, how about that? And we are at the end, we're going to see how things sort of conclude and wrap up for our heroes, now that uh, King Hagrid's castle has crumbled into the ocean, the unicorns are back loose upon the earth. Chapter 14, last one. Once the sea had taken back their diamond-shaped footprints, there was no sign that they had ever been there, any more than King Hagrid's castle had been. The only difference was that Molly Grew remembered unicorns very well. It's good that she went by without saying goodbye, she said to herself. I would have been stupid. I'm going to be stupid in a minute. Anyway, but it really is better like this. Then a warmth moved over her cheek and into her hair, like sunlight, and she turned and put her arms around the unicorn's neck. Oh, you stayed, she whispered. You stayed. She was about to be very foolish then and ask, Will you stay? but the unicorn slipped gently from her and moved to where Prince Lear lay, with his dark blue eyes already losing their color. She stood over him, and as he... Oh, she stood over him as he guarded the Lady Amalthea. She can restore him, Smendrick said, Smendrick said softly. A unicorn's horn is proof against death itself. Molly looked closely at him, as she had not done for a long time and she saw that he had come at last to his power and his beginning. She could not say how she knew, for no wild glory burned about him, and no recognizable omens occurred in his honor just at that moment. He was Smendrick the Magician, as ever, and yet somehow it was for the first time. It was long that the unicorn stood by Prince Lear before she touched him with her horn. For all that her quest had ended joyously, there was weariness in the way she held herself, and a sadness in her beauty that Molly had never seen. It suddenly seemed to her that the unicorn's sorrow was not for Lear, but for the lost girl who could not be brought back, for the Lady Amalthea, who might have lived happily ever after with the prince. The unicorn bowed her head, and her horn glanced across Lear's chin as clumsily as a first kiss. He sat up, blinking, smiling at something long ago. Father, he said in a quick, wondering voice. Father, I had a dream. Then he saw the unicorn, and he rose to his feet as the blood on his face began to shine and move again. He said, I was dead. The unicorn touched him a second time, over the heart, letting her horn rest there for a little space. They were both trembling. Prince Lear put his hands out to her like words. She said, I remember you. I remember. When I was dead, Prince Lear began, but she was away. Not a stone rattled down after her. Not a brush, not a bush tore out as she sprang up the cliff. She went as lightly as the shadow of a bird. And when she looked back, with one cloven foot poised and the sunlight on her sides, with her head and neck absurdly fragile for the burden of the horn. Then each of the three bellow called to her in pain. Then each of the three bellow called to her in pain. It literally just says that. I don't know what that means. She turned and vanished, but Molly Grew saw their voices thump home into her like arrows, and even more than she wished the unicorn back, she wished that she had not called. So the unicorn must have gone like, or something like that. A way of saying that. Prince Lear said, As soon as I saw her, I knew that I had been dead. It was so the other time, when I looked down from my father's tower and saw her. He glanced, down, he glanced up then and drew in his breath. It was the only sound of grief for Haggard that any living thing ever made. Was it I? he whispered. The curse said that I would be the one to bring the castle down, but I would never have done it. He was not good to me, 
but it was only because I was not what he wanted. Is it my doing that he has fallen? Smendrick replied, If you had not tried to save the unicorn, she would never have turned on the red bull and driven him into the sea. It was the red bull who made the overflow and so set the other unicorns free, and it was only they who destroyed the castle. Would you have it otherwise, knowing this? Prince Lear shook his head, but he said nothing. Molly asked, But why did the bull run from her? Why didn't he stand and fight? There was no sign of him when they looked out to the sea, though he was surely too vast to have swum out of sight in so short of time. But whether he reached some other shore, or whether the water drew even his great bulk down at last, none of them knew until long after, and he was never again he was never seen again in that kingdom. The Red Bull never fights, Smendrick said. He conquers, but he never fights. He turned to Prince Lear and put a hand on his shoulder. Now you are the king, he said. He touched Molly as well, said something that was more of a whistle than a word, and the three of them floated up the air like milkweed plumes to the top of the cliff. Molly was not frightened. The magic lifted her as gently as though she were a note of music, and it were singing her. That is an awesome line, bottom of 273. The magic lifted her as gently as though she were a note of music and it were singing her. She could feel that it was never very far from being wild and dangerous, but she was sorry when it set her down. No stone of the castle remained, nor any scar. The earth was not even a shade paler where it had stood. Four young men in rusty, ragged armor wandered gaping through the vanished corridors and turned around and around in the absence that had been the great hall. When they saw Lear, Molly, and Schmendrick, they came running toward them, laughing. They fell on their knees before Lear and cried out together, Your Majesty! Long live King Lear! Lear blushed and actually tried to pull them to their feet. Never mind that, he mumbled. Never mind that. Who are you? He peered in amazement from one face to the next. I know you. I do know you. But how can it be? It is true, your majesty, the first of the young men said happily. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) One more time. We are indeed King Haggard's men-at-arms, the same who served him for so many cold and weary years. We fled the castle after you disappeared into the clock, for the Red Bull was roaring, and all the towers were trembling, and we were afraid. We knew that the old curse must be coming home at last. A great wave took the castle, uh, said a second man-at-arms, exactly as the witch foretold. I saw it go spilling down the cliff as slowly as snow, and why we did not go with it, I cannot tell. The wave parted to go around us, another man said, as I never saw any wave do. It was strange water like the ghost of a wave, boiling with a rainbow light. And for a moment it seemed to me, he rubbed his eyes and shrugged and smiled helplessly, I don't know. It was like a dream. But what what has happened to you all? Lear demanded. You were old men when I was born, and now you're younger than I am. What miracle is this? The three who had spoken giggled and looked embarrassed, but the fourth man replied, It is a miracle of meaning, what we said. Once we told the Lady Amalthea that we would grow young again if she wished it so, and we must have been telling the truth. Where is she? We will go to her aid if it means facing the Red Bull himself. King Lear said, She is gone. Find my horse and saddle him. Find my horse. His voice was harsh and hungry, and the men-at-arms scrambled to obey their new lord. But Smendrick, standing beside him, said quietly, Your Majesty... It may not be. You must not follow her. The king turned and looked like Haggard. Magician, she is mine. He paused and then went on in a gentler tone, close to pleading. She was twice raised. She has twice raised me up from death. And what will I be without her but dead for a third time? He took Smendrick by the wrists with the grip strong enough to powder bones, but the magician did not move. Lear said, 
I am not King Haggard. I have no wish to capture her, but only to spend my life following after her, miles, leagues, even years behind, never seeing her, perhaps, but content. It is my right. A hero is entitled to his happy ending, when it comes at last. But Smendrick answered, This is not the end, either for you or for her. You are the king of a wasted land where there, was never, there has never been any king but fear. Your true task has just begun. You may not know in your life if you have succeeded in it, but only if you fail. As for her, she is a story with no ending, happy or sad. She can never belong to anything mortal enough to want her. Most strangely, then, he put his arms around the young king and held him so for a time. Yet, be content, my lord, he said in a low voice. No man has ever had more of her grace than you, and no other will ever be blessed by her remembrance. You have loved her and served her. Be content and be king. But that is not what I want, Lear cried. The magician answered, not a word, but only looked at him. Blue eyes stared back into green, a face grown lean and lordly into one neither a face grown lean and lordly into one neither so handsome nor so bold. The king began to squint and blink as though he were gazing at the sun, and it was not long before he lowered his eyes and muttered, So be it. I will stay and rule alone over a wretched people in a land I hate. But I will have no more joy of my rule than poor Haggard ever had. A small autumn cat with a crooked ear stalked out of some secret fold in the air and yawned at Molly. She caught him up against her face, and he tangled his paws in her hair. Smendrick smiled and said to the king, We must leave you now. Will you come with us? and see us in friendship to the edge of your domain? There is much between here and there that is worth your study, and I can promise you that there will be some sign of unicorns. Then King Lear shouted for his horse again, and his men searched for it and found it. But there were none for Smendrick and Molly. Yet when they came back with the king's horse, they turned at his amazed stare and saw two more horses trailing docilely behind them, one black and one brown and both already saddled and bridled. Smendrick took the black for himself and gave the brown horse to Molly. She was afraid of them at first. Are they yours? she asked him. Did you make them? Can you do that now? Just make things? The king's whisper echoed her wonder. I found them, the magician answered. But what I mean by finding is not what you mean. Ask me no more. He lifted her into the saddle and then leaped up himself. So the three of them rode away, and the men-at-arms followed on foot. No one looked back, for there was nothing to see. King, but King Lear said once, without turning, it's strange to have grown to manhood in a place, and then to have it gone, and everything changed, and to suddenly be king. Was none of it real at all? Was none of it real at all? Am I real then? Smendrick made no reply. King Lear wished to go swiftly, but Smendrick held them to a leisurely pace in a roundabout road. When the king fretted for speed, he was admonished to consider his walking men, though they, marvelously, never tired for all the lengths of the journey. But Molly soon understood that the magician was delaying in order to make Lear gaze long and closely at his realm, and to her surprise, she discovered that the land was worth the look, for very slowly, Spring was coming to the barren country that had been Haggard's. A stranger would not have noticed the change, but Molly could see that the withered earth was brightening with a greenness as shy as smoke. Squat, snaggly trees that had never yet bloomed were putting forth flowers in the, way, the wary way an army sends out scouts. Long dry, streams were one, long, dry streams were beginning to rustle in their beds and small creatures were calling to one another. Smells slipped by in ribbons, pale grass and black mud, honey and walnuts, mint and hay and rotting applewood, and even the afternoon sunlight 
had a tender, sneezy scent that Molly would have known anywhere. She rode beside Smendrick, watching the gentle advent of the spring and thinking of how it had come to her, late but lasting. Unicorns have passed here, she whispered to the magician. Is that the cause, or is it Haggard's fall, or the Red Bull's going? What is it? What is happening? Everything, he answered her. Everything, all at once. It is not one springtime, but fifty, and not one or two great terrors flown away, but a thousand small shadows lifted from the land. Wait and see. Speaking for Lear's ear, he added, nor is this the first spring that has ever been in this country. It was a good land long ago, and it wants little but a true king to be so again. See how often it softens before you. Oh, see how it softens before you. King Lear said nothing, but his eyes roved left and right as he rode, and he could not but observe the ripening. Even the valley of Hagsgate, of evil memory, was stirring with all manner of wildflowers, columbine, Harabel, lavender, and lupine, foxglove, and yarrow. The rutted footprints of the red bull were growing mellow with mallow. But when they came to Hagsgate, deep in the afternoon, a strange and savage sight awaited them. The plowed fields were woefully torn and ravaged, while the rich orchards and vineyards had been stamped down, leaving no grove or arbor standing. It was, such shat- it was such shattering ruin as the bull himself might have wrought. But it seemed to Molly Grew as though fifty years' worth of foiled griefs had struck Hagsgate all at once, just as that many springtimes were at last warming the rest of the land. The trampled earth looked oddly ashen in the late light. King Lear said quietly, What is this? Right on, your majesty, the magician replied. Right on. The sun was setting as they passed through the overthrown gates of the town and guided their horses slowly down streets that were choked with boards and belongings and broken glass, with pieces of walls and windows, chimneys, chairs, kitchenware, roofs, bathtubs, beds, mantles, dressing tables. Every house in Hagsgate was down. Everything that could be broken was. The town looked as though it had been stepped on. The people of Hagsgate sat on their doorsteps wherever they could find them, considering the wreckage. They had always had the air of paupers, even in the midst of plenty, and the real ruin made them appear almost relieved and no whit poorer. They hardly noticed Lear when he rode up to them until he said, I am the king. What has befallen you here? It was an earthquake, one man murmured dreamily, but another contradicted him, saying, It was a storm, a nor'easter straight off the sea. It shook the town to bits, and hail came down like hooves. Still another man insisted that it was a mighty tide had washed over Hagsgate, a tide as white as dog's wood and heavy as marble, that drowned none and smashed everything. King Lear listened to them all, grimming, smiling grimly. Listen, he said when they were done. King Haggard is dead, and the castle is fallen. I am Lear, the son of Hagsgate, who has who was abandoned at birth in order to keep the witch's curse from coming true, and this from happening. He swept an arm around him at the burst houses. Wretched, silly people, the unicorns have returned. The unicorns that you saw the Red Bull hunting and pretended not to see. It was they who brought the castle down, and the town as well as you. But it is your greed and your fear that have destroyed you. The town folks sighed in resignation, but a middle-aged woman stepped forward and said with some spirit, It all seems a bit unfair, my lord, begging your pardon. What could we have done to save the unicorns? We were afraid of the red bull. What could we have done? One word. Might have been enough, King Lear replied. You'll never know now. He would have wheeled his horse and left them there, but a feeble, rowpy voice called to him, Lear, little Lear, my child, my king. Molly and Smendrick recognized the man who came shuffling up with his arms open, wheezing and limping as though he were older than he truly was. It was Drin. 
Who are you? the king demanded. What do you want of me? Drin pawed at his, at his stirrups, nuzzling his boots. You don't know me, my boy. No, how should you? How should I deserve to have you know me? I am your father, your poor old overjoyed father. I am the one who left you in the marketplace on that winter night long ago. I handed you over to your heroic destiny. How wise I was, and how sad for so long, and how proud I am of you now. My boy, my little boy. He could not quite cry real tears, but his nose was running. Without a word, King Lear tugged at the horse's reins, backing him out of the crowd. Old Drin let out his outstretched arms, let his outstretched arms drop to his sides. This is what it is to have children, he screeched. Ungrateful son, will you desert your father in the hour of his distress? When a word from your pet wizard could have said every could would have set everything right again? Despise me if you will, but I've played my part in putting you where you are, and you dare not deny it. The villainy has its rights too. Still the king would have turned away, but Smendrick touched his arm and leaned near. It's true, you know, he whispered. But for him, but for them all, the tale would have worked out quite another way. And who could say that the ending would have been even as happy as this? You must be their king, and you must rule them as kindly as you would a braver and more faithful folk, for they are part of your fate. Then Lear lifted his hand to the people of Hag's Gate, and they pushed and elbowed one another for silence. He said, I must ride with my friends and keep them company for a way, but I will leave my men-at-arms here, and they will help you begin to build your town again. When I return, in a little time, I also will help. I will not begin to build my new castle until I see Hagsgate standing once more. They complained bitterly that Smendrick could do it all in a moment by means of his magic, but he, but, uh, but he answered them. I could not, even if I would. There are laws that govern the wizard's art, as laws command the seasons of the sea. Magic made you wealthy once, when all others in the land were poor. But your days of prosperity are ended, and now you must start over. What was wasteland in Haggard's time shall grow green and generous again. But Hagsgate will yield a living exactly as miserly as the hearts that dwell there. You may plant your acres again, and raise up your fallen orchards and vineyards, but they will never flourish as they used to, never, until you learn to take joy in them for no reason. He gazed on the silent townsfolk, with no anger in his glance, but only pity. If I were you, I would have children, he said. And then to King Lear. How says your majesty? Shall we sleep here tonight and be on our way at dawn? But the king turned and rode away out of the ruined hag's gate as fast as he could spur. It was long before Molly and the magician came up with him, and longer still before they lay down to sleep. For many days they journeyed through King Lear's domain, and each day they knew it less and delighted in it more. The spring ran on before them as swiftly as fire, clothing all that was naked and opening everything that had long ago shut up tight, touching the earth as the unicorn had touched Lear. Every sort of animal, from bears to black beetles, came sporting or shambling or scurrying along their way, and the high sky, that had been as sandy and arid as the soil itself, now blossomed with birds, swirling so thickly that it seemed like sunset most of the day. Fish bent and flickered in the whisking streams, and wildflowers raced up and down the hills like escaped prisoners. All the land was noisy with life, and if, but it was the silent rejoicing of the flowers that kept the three travelers awake at night. The folk of the villages greeted them cautiously and with little less dourness than they had shown when Smendrick and Molly first came that way. Only the oldest among them had ever seen the spring before, and many suspected the rampaging greenness of being a plague or an invasion. King Lear told them that Haggard was dead and that the Red Bull was gone forever, invited them to visit him when his new castle was raised, and passed on. They will need time to feel comfortable with flowers, he said. Wherever they stopped, he left word that all outlaws were pardoned, and Molly hoped that the news would 
come to Captain Cully and his merry band. As it happened, it did, and all the merry band immediately abandoned the life of the Greenwood, saving only Cully himself and Jack Jingly. Together, they took up the trade of wandering minstrels and were reported to have become reasonably popular in the provinces. One night, the three slept at the farthest frontier of Lear's kingdom, making their beds in the high grass. The king would bid them farewell in the morning and return to Hagsgate. You will be lonely, he said in the darkness. I would rather go with you and not be king. Oh, you'll get to like it, Smendrick replied. The best young men in the villages will make their way to your court, and you will teach them to be knights and heroes. The wisest of ministers will come to counsel you. The most skillful excuse me, the most skillful musicians and jugglers and storytellers will come seeking your favor. And there will be a princess in time, either fleeing her unspeakably unspeakably wicked father and brothers, or seeking justice for them. Perhaps you will hear of her, shut away in a fortress of flint and adamant, only her companion, a compassionate spider. I don't care about that, King Lear said. He was silent for so long that Smendrick thought he had fallen asleep. But presently he said, I wish I could see her once more, to tell her all my heart. She will never know what I really meant to say. You did promise that I would see her. The magician answered him sharply. I promised only that you would see some sign of unicorns, and so you have. Your realm is blessed beyond any land's deserving, because they have passed across it in freedom. As for you and your heart and the things you said and didn't say, she will remember them all when men are fairy tales and books written by rabbits. Think of that and be still. The king spoke no more after that, and Mendrick repented his words. Great words. That's the bottom of 286. She touched you twice, he said in a little while. The first touch was to bring you to life again, but the second was for you. Lear did not answer and the magician never knew if he had heard or not. Smendrick dreamed that the unicorn came and stood by him at moonrise. The thin night wind lifted and spilled her mane, and the moon shone on the snowflake crafting of her small head. He knew it was a dream, but he was happy to see her. How beautiful you are, he said. I never really told you. He would have roused the others, but her eyes sang him a warning as clearly as two frightened birds, and he knew that if he moved to call Molly and Lear, he would wake himself and she would vanish. So he said only, They love you more, I think, though I do the best I can. That is why, she said, and she could not tell what she was answering. He lay very still, oh, and he could not tell what she was answering. He lay very still, hoping that he would remember the exact shape of her ears when he did wake in the morning. She said, you are a true and mortal wizard now, as you've always wished. Does it make you happy? Yes, he replied with a quiet laugh. I'm not poor haggard to lose my heart's desire in the having of it. But there are wizards and wizards. There is black magic and white magic, and the infinite shades of gray between. I see now that it is all the same. Whether I decide to be what men call a wise and good magician, aiding heroes, thwarting wishes, witches, wicked lords, and unreasonable parents, making rain, curing wool sorters' disease, and the mad staggers, getting cats down from trees, or whether I choose the retorts full of elixirs and essences, the powders and herbs and beans, and padlock books of grammar bound and skins better left unnamed, the muddy mist darkening in the chamber, and the sweet lisping therein, the sweet voice lisping therein. Why, life is short, and how many can I help or harm? I have, law, I have my power at last, but the world is still too heavy for me to move, though my friend Lear might think otherwise. He la and he laughed again in his dream, a little sadly. The unicorn said, That is true. You are a man, and men can do nothing that makes any difference. But her voice was strangely slow and burdened. She asked, Which will you choose? The magician laughed for a third time. Oh, it will be the kind magic, undoubtedly, because you would like it more. 
I do not think that I will ever see you again, but I will try to do what would please you if you knew. And you, where will you be for the rest of my life? I thought you would have gone home to your forest by now. She turned a little away from him, and the sudden starlight of her shoulders made all his talk of magic taste like sand in his throat. Moths and midges and other night insects, too small to be anything in particular, came and danced slowly around her bright horn. And this did not make her appear foolish, but them the most wise and lovely as they celebrated her. Molly's cat rubbed in and out between her forefeet. This is page 288. The others have gone, she said. They are scattered to the woods they came from. No two together. And men will not catch sight of them much more easily than if they were still in the sea. I will go back to my forest, too. But I do not know if I will live contentedly there or anywhere. I have been mortal, and some part of me is mortal yet. I am full of tears and hunger and the fear of death, though I cannot weep, and I want nothing, and I cannot die. I am not like the others now, for no unicorn was ever born who could regret, but I do. I regret. Smendrick hid his face like a child, though he was a great magician. I am sorry. I am sorry, he mumbled into his wrist. I have done you evil, as Nikos did to the other unicorn, with the same good will. And I can do no more, I can no more undo it than he could. Mommy Fortuna and King Haggard and the Red Bull together were kinder to you than I. But she answered him gently, saying, My people are in the world again. No sorrow will live in me as long as that joy. Save one, and I thank you for that, too. Farewell, good magician. I will try to go home. She made no sound when she left him, but he was awake, and the crook-eared cat was meowing lonesomely. Turning his head, he saw the moonlight trembling in the open eyes of King Lear and Molly Grew. The three of them lay awake till morning, and nobody said a word. At dawn, King Lear rose up and saddled his horse. Before he mounted, he said to Smendrick and Molly, I would like it if you came to see me one day. They assured him that they would. But still he lingered with them, twisting the dangling reins about his fingers. I dreamed about her last night, he said. Molly cried, So did I! And Smendrick opened his mouth and then closed it again. King Lear said hoarsely, By our friendship, I beg you, Tell me what she said to you. His hands gripped one hand each of theirs, and his clutch was cold and painful. Smendrick gave him a weak smile. My lord, I so rarely remember my dreams. It seems to me that we spoke solemnly of silly things, as one does. Grave nonsense, empty and evanescent. The king let go of his hand and turned his half-mad gaze on Molly Grew. I'll never tell, she said, a, a little frightened. But flushing oddly. I remember, but I'll never tell anyone, if I die for it, not even you, my lord. She was not looking at him as she spoke, but at Smendrick. King Lear let her hand fall as well, and he swung himself into the saddle so fiercely that his horse reared up across the sunrise, bugling like a stag. But Lear kept his seat and glared down at Molly and Smendrick with a face so grim and scored and sunken that he might well have been as long as King Haggard before him. Oh, that he might well have been as long as Haggard before him. She said nothing to me, he whispered. Do you understand? She said nothing to me. Nothing at all. And his face softened, as even King Haggard's face had gone a little gentle when he watched the unicorns in the sea. For that moment, he was again the young prince who liked to sit with Molly in the scullery. She looked at me in my dream. She looked at me and never spoke. He rode away without goodbye, and they watched after him until the hills hid him, the straight, sad horseman going home to be king. Molly said at last, Oh, the poor man, poor Lear. He's not fared so badly, the magician answered. Great heroes need great sorrows and burdens, or half their greatness goes unnoticed. It is all part of the fairy tale. 
but his voice was a little doubtful, and he laid his arm softly around Molly's shoulders. It cannot be an ill fortune to have loved a unicorn, he said. Surely it must be the darkest luck of all, though the hardest earned. By and by, he put her as far from him as his finger ends and asked her, Now, will you tell me what it was she said to you? But Molly Grew only laughed and shook her head till her hair came down, and she was more beautiful than the Lady Amalthea. The magician said, Very well, then I'll find the unicorn again, and perhaps she will tell me. And he turned calmly to whistle up their steeds. She said no word while he saddled his horse. But when he began on her uh, but when he began on her own, she put her hand on his arm. Do you think do you truly hope that we may find her? There was something I forgot to say. Smendrick looked at her over his shoulder. The morning sunlight made his eyes seem gay as grass. But now and then, when he stooped into the horse's shadow, there stirred a deeper greenness in his gaze. The green of pine needles that has a faint, cool bitterness about it. He said, I fear it, for her sake. It would mean that she too is a wanderer now, and that is a fate for human beings, not for unicorns. But I hope, of course, I hope. Then he smiled at Molly and took her hand in his. Anyway, since you and I must choose one road to follow, out of the many that run to the same place in the end, it might as well be a road that a unicorn has taken. We may never see her, but we will always know where she has been. Come, then. Come with me. So they began their new journey, which took them in its time in and out of most of the folds of the sweet, wicked, wrinkled world, and so at last to their own strange and wonderful destiny. But that was all later, and first, not ten minutes out of Lear's kingdom, they met a maiden who came hurrying toward them on foot. Her dress was torn and smirched, but the richness of its making was still plain to see. And though her hair was tumbled and brambled, her arms stretched, and her fair face dirty, there was no mistaking her for anyone but a princess in woeful distress. Smendrick lighted down to support her, and she clutched him with both hands as though he were a grapefruit hull. A rescue, she cried to him. A rescue, oh, secure. And ye be a man of mettle and sympathy. Aid me now. I hight the Princess Alison Jocelyn, daughter to Good, King Giles, and him foully murdered by his brother, the bloody Duke Wolf, who hath taken my three brothers, the Princess Corin, Calvin, and, and Colin, and Calvin, and cast them into a fell prison as hostages, and that I will wed his fat son, the Lord Dudley, but I bribed the sentinel and sopped the dogs. But Smendrick and the magician, but Smendrick the magician raised his hand she fell silent, staring at him in wonder of wide lilac eyes. Fair princess, he said gravely to her, the man you want just went that way, and he pointed back toward the land they had so lately quitted. Take my horse, and you will be up with him while your shadow is still behind you. He cupped his hands for the princess Alice and Jocelyn, and she climbed wearily into <laughs> Alice and Jocelyn, I like that, uh, and she climbed wearily in some bewilderment to the saddle. Smendrick turned the horse, saying, You will surely overtake him with ease, for he will be riding slowly. He is a good man, and a hero of greater cause than uh, and a hero greater than any cause is worth. I will send my I send all my princesses to him. Ugh, I gotta do the sentence again, it's too good. You will surely overtake him with ease, for he'll be riding slowly. He is a good man, and a hero greater than any cause is worth. I send all my princesses to him. His name is Lear. Then he slapped the horse on the rump sent it off the way King Lear had gone. And then he laughed for so long that he was too weak to get up behind Molly and had to walk beside her horse for a while. When he caught his breath again, he began to sing, and she joined with him. And this is what they sang as they went away together, out of the story and into another. I am no king and I am no lord, and I am no soldier at arms, said he. I'm none but a harper, and a very poor harper, then am come hither to wed ye. If you were a lord, you should be my lord, 
And the same if you were a thief, said she. And if you were a harper, you shall be my harper, for it makes no matter to me, to me, for it makes no matter to me. But what if I prove that I am no harper, that I lied for your love most monstrously? Why then, I'll teach you to play and sing, for I dearly love a good harp, said she. Of course, they're going to make me end with singing. Ugh. Well, did the best I could. Sort of a medieval brogue to it. That is the end, folks. But let us continue with this last page, which is a quote from Peter S. Beagle and his biography. One last page. Can you handle that? Let's get everything. Peter S. Beagle. When I was four years old, my mother, she was a school teacher, brought me into her classroom one day, and I wound up telling her students a story about unicorns. When I was done, according to her, I very formally said to all of them, thank you. I will come back and tell you more about unicorns someday. I like to think that when I wrote The Last Unicorn two decades later, I was finally keeping that promise. That's Peter S. Beagle. Peter S. Beagle was born in 1939 and raised in the Bronx, a few blocks from Woodlawn Cemetery, the inspiration for his first novel, A Fine and Private Place. Today, thanks to the classic works such as The Last Unicorn, Tamsin, and The Innkeeper's Song, he is acknowledged as America's greatest living fantasy author, and his dazzling abilities with language, characters, and magical storytelling have earned him many millions of fans around the world. Peter has written numerous teleplays and screenplays in addition to his stories and novels. They include the animated versions of The Lord of the Rings, wow, The Last Unicorn, plus the fan favorite Sarek episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. His nonfiction book, I See by My Outfit, which recounts a 1963 journey across America on motor scooter, is considered a classic of American travel writing. He's also a gifted poet, lyricist, and singer-songwriter. For more on Peter's career and upcoming works, go to www.peterbeagle.com. That does it, folks. Did you like that? Wow. Um, don't remember, obviously, The Village of Hagsgate from the animated movie, which was my only point of reference prior to reading this with you all. Um, so I liked kind of they, they brought that in. You have to find out what happened to that town and everything like that. Uh, I liked that uh, there was a heroine in need of a, a hero. Um, coming into the scene at the end. I don't know, I just thought it was a pretty cool ending. Uh, ended with a song, which I could have done without singing extemporaneously here, but I think I did it some justice. So there you go, folks. Look, if this is the first time you ever heard me read, uh, I read a few other books. Again, I originally did all this for my kids, and I, this is they're still my primary audience. This is something that they can always watch um, as they're growing up. But I know that your families and the young at heart have all been enjoying this as well. So drop me a comment. Let me know what you thought of it, if you made it all the way through. I always think it's great. I'd like to hear from anybody who spent this many hours with me reading this great story. And uh, I hope if you haven't done this already, please support the author. Obviously, they own the copyright. They wrote the story. I did a dramatic delivery of their material um, with a book I purchased, and they deserve to, to be uh, compensated. So I hope that uh, you'll purchase a copy of the book or get it on Audible if you'd like a nice, clean uh, sort of comment and verbal flub-free version of it. All right, so hope to hear from you in the comments of some of the other books I've read here. Thank you to the karma gods that have allowed these videos to stay here on the web for all of us to enjoy. And I hope that I'll see you on the next one.